So my the title of my talk is uh, Computational Fluid Dynamics as a Tool to Combat uh, Human Diseases. I try to look for uh, a word to capture the range of uh, projects that we look at in the biomedical uh, field. So I'm a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Um, for background, uh, prior to joining uh, UCF, I was a professor uh, at Northeastern University. And long before that, I was a principal research faculty at MIT. Um, so we have published about seven books and I'm currently a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So my research spans about four different areas, major areas, although I'm going to be focusing on only two. We have the respiratory system, the coronary uh, artery or what we call cardiovascular system. And in those, I will only be able to talk about a couple of the, uh, of the areas uh, in which we are working. Uh, some new areas that I have recently initiated in collaboration with UCF faculty on tissue engineering, advanced manufacturing of ultrastructures with Dr. Jihua Go, uh, tissue engineering with Dr. Stephanie Flossite and uh, Dr. Far uh, Hassan Farouche of computer science. Uh, I won't be able to talk about those today, but uh, you know, there are projects hopefully in the future we can talk about very interesting projects. My teaching, I teach uh, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, biofluid mechanics course, which I originally developed at UCF and then research methods. <clears throat> uh, the motivation for my work, as I said, uh, is computational fluid dynamics and comp computational fluid dynamics simply means the use of numerical methods to solve uh, fluid flow and associated uh, 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 processes, which includes mass transport, thermal transport, and uh, recently, uh, structural dynamics, you know, all these have been grouped together. So computational fluid dynamics allows us to be able to study all these, uh, uh, to model all these uh, processes. So the motivation for me is the fact that if you look at a lot of the diseases of the human body, they are, uh, they, they, in fact, mostly a lot of them, both in the origin and the proliferation of many of these diseases, they are governed by some form of fluid flow uh, or mass transport or heat transfer. So I just, so that was how why I focus on that area. But CFD also can be used in so many other ways, including providing sort of what we call virtual experiments. You know, so if you have been able to validate it for a particular process, you can use it to, to project forward and even beyond what intuition or even what is uh, achievable. You know, in medical practice, most of the time, it's very difficult to get a lot of data in vivo. So if you, if you can validate the CFD model for a particular situation, then it will be easy to project. And then, and even recently in the work we're doing with uh, uh, Dr. Farouche and uh, Dr. Flossai, we're trying to see also use CFD to provide uh, additional data for which can serve as data for uh, uh, technologies like uh, uh, machine learning. Okay. Again, amongst all these, the key word is validation because there is a, uh, a refrain in computation called JIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So a lot depends on, uh, it depends on a lot of simulation of physical laws and assumptions. So validation of the, of the, uh, of these uh, models are very, very key before we start extending them. Uh, and my teaching, the motivation for my teaching is that I enjoy student engagement and collaboration, whether with faculty and among themselves. So I like to encourage collaboration among students. Uh, I like student learning, so I like to, I, I, I'm very fascinated with that, that is the asset of uh, looping my uh, assessments, I test student the first semester, if, I mean the, the, the first quiz or first exam, if it doesn't do well, majority of students, I make sure I find a way to recycle those, uh, those um, places where, or those questions where students were not doing very well. So at the end, maybe two or three more times before, so that one can, at least I said the performance of students. I'll talk about this idea of personalized training later towards my... Okay, so again, uh, as far as uh, my projects, I'm going to focus on only about uh, three or four of them. The first one is uh, what I call long elasticity, or uh, long dynamics. The whole, why do we want to uh, study long dynamics or even uh, long elasticity? For first, that we want to be able to target two more, well, I, I hope you can see my arrow here. Uh, so the lower, lower left uh, quadrant here. 
So imagine you have a tumor uh, in a radiotherapy, a typical radiotherapy process takes about 15 minutes. So, I mean, lung cancer, actually non-small cells, uh, lung cancers have unique features in the sense that, in the sense that the, they are not stationary, unlike maybe breast cancer or kidney or whatever, where the, the, you know, the, the, the tumors are almost stationary and they can be targeted. But in the case of lung, it's very it's impossible because we can't expect a patient to hold the breath for 15 minutes. So that's where the problem was that, that we want to be able to target the tumor so that, so that uh, we don't expose uh, these surrounding healthy tissues to unwanted radiation. So that is the objective of that. But even, so of course, so you need elasticity to be able to do the deformation and you know, uh, calculation using flow structure interaction, and then for you to be able to determine where is the location of the tumor. So the other issue, the other objective is the fact, uh, I mean, rather the other motivation is the fact that it's been found that a lot of lung diseases correlate with the elasticity. For example, if you are talking of bronchitis, they are in the range of about 20 kilopascals, uh, elastic modulus, uh, young modulus. If you go to the sort of fibrotic, uh, things, they are about 100. So we can even use this elasticity to classify the type of uh, disease, COPD and so, so many of them. So therefore, what we said initially is to say, okay, how do we get the elasticity of the human lung? And we're surprised when we started this project, there was not a single, a single project, a, a single uh, information about the elasticity of human lung. Also, of course, elasticity of human lung is also is heterogeneous, you know, so it varies with the state of disease. It, is, it varies from patient to patient to patient. So we then came about a method to actually determine the patient-specific elasticity, which integrates uh, for the CT, uh, the four-dimensional CT imaging with uh, deformable image re registration, and we combine that with our CFD to be able to reconstruct the uh, uh, spatial distribution of the lung uh, of the lung elasticity from where we then predicted the deformation and were able to track the the, the, the tumor. So um, what we are showing here is what I mentioned about validation. So after we predict it, we have to make sure that we are approximating some landmarks. So we pick some landmarks on the apical lung, uh, and then we compare with our deformation. And we were very impressed because uh, we got a resolution of uh, about less than three millimeters, you know, difference between, or error of about less than three millimeters between the uh, between the what is obtained from imaging and what we uh, predicted but the the summary outcome is the fact that we now have a unique a, 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 a method for regular determination of the patient specific lung i mean uh, lung elasticity over a range of uh, whether the patient has copd or what we are able to characterize and re represent the spatial distribution of the elasticity and that has spawned uh, the development of what we call four-dimensional or deformable lung phantom, which could be used for radiotherapy. In fact, this was uh, actually uh, recorded uh, here at UCF on national, I mean, on local and national news when it was made uh, that we can use the result of the patient's project uh, and then make a phantom that could be uh, that could be that could simulate uh, human breathing. You know, and that also spawned of a. UCF, a collaborative uh, project, uh, spin-off between UCF and uh, and uh, UCLA, you know, which has raised a few million dollars from uh, from venture firms to be able to develop this deformable phantom. All right. So the next uh, project uh, again is cough yeah, and penetrant uh, in patients. Uh, as you guys are aware, cough has now recently become not notorious because of coronavirus that, oh, cough is bad. But in actual fact, cough is actually a good thing for the person coughing because a cough serves a protective uh, role, you know, a function, you know, which can be preventative or, or um, corrective, you know, for, for pulmonary health. Basically, what cough does is to help to expel unwanted penetrance that might penetrate, that, that might go into the, into the uh, airway, you know, most especially, we've done a lot of work on this, but I will focus on just on what I call the aspiration uh, potential. What we mean is that uh, maybe food drop, uh, maybe food crumbs or particulates or droplets 
you know, which are supposed to not, not naturally go into the uh, esophagus and to the stomach and to the penile. But when they find their way into the airway, they become dangerous. In fact, for example, for people with laryngeal function disorders, like people with a neurological disease like uh, Parkinson's, I think about 70% of the deaths for Parkinson's patients usually result from what we call aspiration pneumonia. That is some other penetrance going into the trachea, you know, going to the trachea into the lungs. And of course, in the case of coronavirus, I'm sure everybody's aware they said, you know, once the coronavirus have led the oropharynx and go into the uh, uh, trachea, into the lung, that that's when, we, when they become very dangerous. So the first 48 hours when they can be, so they can be interacted with. So that's when, that's why a lot of the initial technology was about that. So what I worked about cough is, the mechanism of cough is very complex. The only thing I want you to take away is that cough is like an explosion. Explosive, so it's characterized by very high velocity, and of course there are also kinds of com complications. You know when you have a flow that is very transient and very uh, and uh, very explosive, and then of course sometimes a single cough is not enough for you to expel. You know this air penetrance with muco, you need to be able to have sequential cough. That is one cough after the other. That's typically what happens. So therefore we, we were able to. Uh, reconstruct a uh, human uh, airway and uh, the oral cavity and the nasal cavity from a uh, CT scans. And then from there, we do what is called flow structure interaction. And then we decide to you know, monitor the uh, behavior of different particles, solid and liquid. In this case, a droplet, a liquid droplet. And uh, of course, the behavior depends on where they originate and, and uh, the kind of cough condition they are subjected to. For example, you have a, uh, a particle. I'm looking at the third, if you can see my, in the, I'm in the third, in the right hand side uh, quadrant now. You have a particle that is represented by this small dot. And then, depending on the kind of curve they're subjected to, it can be, it can then break up into smaller droplets, which is what is, uh, I'm sorry, let me remove this. So, which is what is uh, represented here. And when you have very strong curve, these, if they are droplets, can break up into small particles. And then, fortunately, small particles, they can act as tracers and follow the cough out of your mouth. So that is what we want. But if the cough is weak, we call it weak cough, actually with characteristic of pa patients with, you know, uh, with laryngeal function disorder, like all the, what I mentioned before, they are very, very weak cough. The, the upper airway structures are already weakened. They can't cough well, they can swallow well, and that those uh, Droplets can coagulate and form larger droplets, and most of the time they just go straight into the lung, and that's why a lot of them uh, die. So we have been able to quantify this process, um, and then the more importantly, what a major outcome of this is the, is the potential of using what is called respiratory uh, muscle strength uh, training to be able to train the upper way. If we can affect the, the muscles of the upper way, then it will be possible to to uh, assist their cough. You know, that's one project that we're working on with the Head and Public Affairs, uh, particularly Dr. Barry Hoffman of, uh, of HPA. And then uh, the next project quickly uh, that I'll mention is Obstructive Sleep Apnea. This was something that was uh, brought to us uh, with Dr. Stroh of uh, Case Western. It's one of the uh, most well-renowned uh, experts in uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. But basically, the idea was to see whether we can use our project to try and understand the role of the mechanical uh, uh, stresses, or, or you know, uh, the mechanics of the upper airway uh, relative to what is called uh, neuromuscular uh, uh, stimulation. Basically, what the work they are doing or what they are working on is to see if they could interact with the, or rather, stimulate or the, what is called the dilator muscle, which is below the tongue when the patient is uh, sleeping in the supine position that is uh, with the back where the when the, the airway patency is almost uh, neg in a zero or negligible and see whether they could stimulate the muscle to i mean the structures to move up with the tongue and therefore open up the airway so we work with them again provided the from ct scan we reconstructed the structures both in the structural and the all the tissues all the structures that are involved and the airway and we did what is called the flow structure interaction, and we're able to look at three different conditions. The first case here, I'm, again, for you, I'm looking at the third, uh, the right-hand quadrant here. One so minute we, left. 
Pardon? One minute left, please. Okay. So we look at that and we're able to show that by simulating it, uh, uh, the dilatum muscle, we're able to uh, maintain uh, airway patency, the opening, even when the patient is sleeping on his or her back. So we are working on that to continue to, uh, to continue to uh, uh, determine the most important uh, place to stimulate, so to improve the opening. And for, for the last project is cardiovascular, for lack of time, but basically this project that we had was, uh, you know, to be able to use uh, fluid dynamics to see if we can, based on the trajectory, uh, the history of a plaque, with the plaque, uh, plaque in the coronary artery, whether it's going to grow to become stable, or whether it's going to be what is called angina or heart uh, uh, chest pain, or it's going to rupture and form what is what leads to heart attack, myocardial infarction. We're able to use a technique combining uh, intravascular ultrasound with bipolar angiography, reconstruct the artery, CFD, and we're able to uh, study the behavior. What we are looking at on the third hydrant here, uh, when you have a heart, I mean, an artery that is opened up, so this was the first time that CFD had been used for clinical trial, really, because we're working with AstraZeneca for two drugs, uh, which here you have the native artery and here you have stated asterisk. We were able to, our model was able to predict what they observed six months later in a six month study, you know. And the last point here is the fact that we all hear that uh, uh, blood pressure, you know, high blood pressure leads to heart attack. This was the first time a CFD was used to quantify what I referred to previously about intermediate plaque being the most vulnerable. People think that when the heart, when the artery is most closed up, that's when you have a heart attack. No, medical doctors have found post mortem that most of the people that die of heart attack, the arteries are only closed up by about 45 percent. Doctors have found that from post post mortem studies, but nobody had been able to validate it numerically. We were the first to do that and found that we had this peak at, at close to 45%. And when you have high blood pressure, this peak shifts towards smaller stenosis, smaller occlusion. So in the short term, I, we are, I'm working to be able to study, most importantly, uh, I like to collaborate with people, do experiments. Uh, fortunately, like you mentioned, that I've been sort of trying to talk to Dr. Subit to see how we can validate my the cough, uh, you know, do some lab experiments. But what more importantly, post-COVID fatigue damage to lungs. You know that most of the people that die from ventilator-induced uh, injury is because of damage to the lung. So I'm working with that in UCLA. And then, of course, I want to continue working with uh, my uh, collaborator in the tissue engineering, very interesting for regenerative medicine. Uh, in the long term, I'm very interested in this idea of using CFD for clinical screening and clinical trials. There is a very interest to the National Institutes of Health. And in education, I like the idea of personalized training, especially with so many students that we have now. A lot of them need to learn at their own pace. So I'm, I've actually talked to a professor in uh, physics who, who does uh, education, uh, who has been developing a, a learning management system to see how we can apply it to thermofluid courses in engineering. Uh, acknowledgements, these are my collaborators over the years for some of these projects, uh, and thank you very much for listening.